that the hero will be right on the trail of the villains, or the villains will be right on the trail of the hero. And in a split second, whoever is being pursued will disappear, or the pursuer will disappear. Like it happens at the end of Don't Live for Tomorrow. Uh, Alan is right on the heels of Jones, and Jones looks around and Alan is gone. And uh, he reappears later, but you never know where he's been. It's just a trick to increase the suspense. And you're like, where have they been? But logic was not uh, one of Christian's strong points. Yeah, we're shooting one film. It might have been a Jason Rogers film. But we're up at my parents' house, and uh, we were sticking your hand into a, a blender and turning the blender on, you know. And, uh, of course, you could have lost your fingers. And uh, we didn't think about that. We just uh, thought about, you know, this would be a cool scene, you know. How did you first get involved with APAR films? A man showed me a firecracker, told me to light it and throw it over my shoulder. I did that and discovered I was also being filmed. Who was that man? That was Chris Doherty. I was up 24 hours editing sometimes. I was, I was obsessed with getting it right. It all started at school when four friends, Alan Saley, Tom Sota, Christian Doughty, and Tom Sinclair, found they had two common interests. 
They enjoy the exploits of TV and movie spies like James Bond and Napoleon Solo, and they enjoyed making up stories. They began by producing their own stories, first in magazines, and then on radio shows that were usually 15-minute long improvised pieces of absurdity. We're now going into a world between light and shadow. A world between the sun and the moon. A world between the two dimensions of the universe. This dimension, this world, is the planet of the nuns. Radio is probably a more creative forum at times when you do shows than movies, which is ironic. And uh, so we finally, we finally found our, uh, our format and uh, we, uh, we took it from there. In 1971, the quartet began making James Bond-influenced movies, usually lifting ideas from the Bond films, such as the mysterious villain stroking a cat, and even titles, Bond's Man with the Golden Gun, became the man with the golden bullet. The movies were produced for a company, Doherty, called APAR Films. I took the name APAR, became a famous sort of pseudonym for names that you've never heard before. And uh, the, the names you've never heard before are APAR. I've never in my experience known someone who is named APAR. APAR Films may have been a four-man band but you'd never know it from the elaborate opening title sequences and credits produced by Doherty. He would devise names of crew members who didn't exist for positions that no one held. For instance, second unit director Telly Malpasso and art director Robert Apar. Sometimes the credits falsely indicated that Doherty seemed to do nothing as a director. The credits listed stunt directors, dialogue coaches and action sequence directors who apparently did all the work. Nothing could be further from the truth. For me, the APAR era <clears throat> began in 1971, uh, specifically the fall of 1971. Quite a time, I guess we were all in 10th grade, uh, all in uh, different schools. Uh, uh, Christian was at Dwight York, uh, Soder and Sally were at St. Hilda's and St. Hugh's, and me, the black sheep, of course, was at a weird place called Yoder School, which is where they sent uh, problem kids who were thrown out of other private schools for various derelictions of, uh, of duty and uh, obedience. Anyway, uh, the four of us had always been into uh, tape-recorded shows, uh, our own, making our own magazines, writing our own stories, so I guess uh, going into movies was a natural progression. and. Uh, but of course, that was Christian's uh, influence. He was the one with the camera and the idea, and said, "Let's let's do it. Let's film." I met Alan Saley a long time ago. I believe in second grade, and uh, and uh, he, uh, he we didn't do the movies, of course, then. But we grew and grew to knew it. We knew each other. I knew uh, Evan Jones too from my childhood. Tom Soder, and Tom Sinclair too, and the four friends uh, just uh, got together and did these wonderful films. Casting was arbitrary. Tom Soter got his part in Wishing You Were Dead because he looked like the ventriloquist dummy into which he was supposed to be transformed. Not as arbitrary was the brilliant camera work and editing done by director Christian Doherty, a natural-born filmmaker. At first, all the editing was done in camera, a remarkable feat. Uh, at the first, we edited with the camera. Uh, as technology grew, we, we of course, uh, used, I used a, a great splicer that I had gotten from Willoughby's camera shop downtown. And uh, it, uh, it was very sharp. It cut the film right where you wanted it. And as the films progressed, the shots became more edited together. Gordy obviously grew into his technique and became... Uh, a lot better at it and he showed a lot of flashes of brilliance. I have to agree with you about that, Tommy. He showed the ability to correct. Thank you.
and Christian is um, the, the, stunt, the, uh, the stunts he would do or the, uh, the chances he would take the, um, when we were doing Don't Live for Tomorrow which uh, had a 20 minute bi a bike chase bike, bus and foot chase uh, not in that order um, Christian did shots sitting on the bike with, riding on a bike with one hand holding the hand on the other hand holding the camera and uh, he, well, he didn't have a steady cam, but he had a steady hand. And uh, he got some incredible tracking shots, which uh, are remarkable even to this day. Nonetheless, not everyone was as skillful as Darty in riding a bike, and accidents could happen. Tom Sinclair that, recalls that, one incident. You know, uh, here I was riding a bicycle, and uh, came to these steps, and Christian was directing me. He said, ride down the steps. And I dutifully rode down the steps and of course fell on my ass and uh, <laughs> uh, it was left in the film uh, with me come, getting up and dusting myself off. The movies were shot on Super 8 film without synchronized sound. They were later scored and dubbed under Doughty's strict supervision. Now, now enunciate when you say it. Yeah, I will. Say, okay, now when I say go, you say stop, come back, alright? Stop! Come back! Make it really, you know... Okay, get ready? One, two, three, now! Stop! Come back! Okay, now a little softer. Now! Stop! Come back! Get ready? One, two, three, now! Hey! What the hell? Again. Hey! What the hell? One, two, three, go! What the devil? All the... Words were dubbed later on a soundtrack, a primitive way of doing it, I admit, but it was the only way we could do it at the time. And now, of course, with modern technology, it's so much better, isn't it? Since there was no on-location sound, the movies were usually improvised, which led to countless illogical sequences such as this one, in which the hero tries to escape his pursuers by climbing on a rickety bramble. You know? Anyone who uh, watches them knows that logic has nothing to do with APAR films. APAR films had nothing to do with logic. What did it matter? They were just great fun. Chris told me to come out of the First National City Bank at 112th and Broadway holding a gun above my head and a bag in the other arm, uh, which I faithfully did. I, as I came running out of the bank holding a gun up and I heard a voice say, hold it, stop, and it turned out it was a couple of policemen there. They didn't have guns drawn, but uh, they were very concerned about uh, what I was doing. Uh, they, I think they had a feeling we were just a bunch of kids, but uh, I think today in 2009 I probably would have a bullet uh, lodged in, in my chest for that. You know, it was just very bizarre. Uh, it was such a strange time uh, in New York, too. Uh, very uh, specific and, and, and uh, lost time, really, because uh, in those movies we were running all over New York filming in the subways, uh, filming in the Statue of Liberty, climbing up to the top of it, which you can't do anymore. You know, you can't go to the top of the Statue of Liberty, much less film in it, much less film in the subways. And we filmed a lot of stuff in the subway. And I remember there was only one time, I think, that Christian was uh, uh, accosted by cops and given a ticket. Cop turned up and asked us if we had a permit. And Christian said no, and the cop gave us a ticket and uh, said, don't do it anymore. So Christian said, fine, he took the ticket, the cop went away, and Christian said, let's film some more, let's continue. And as soon as we started filming, the cop appeared out of nowhere, just out of the blue, and he said, I knew you were going to be filming. Uh, and he took Christian down to the precinct and booked him, and Christian's father had to come down and bail him out. Um, the cops had, uh, had, had given Christian a ticket, and as I recall, Christian took the ticket and we waited a few minutes and resumed filming in the subway. Well, Henry's a British spy who's got an Italian name. 
Um, but he also shares a lot in common with uh, Inspector Clouseau of the Pink Panther films. He does a lot of dumb things. Uh, he's kind of got a whimsical side too, and also he's a brutal cold killer. My name is Sorelli. Henry Sorelli. He's a mover, a serious man, no time loser. On assignment, his actions reveal his alignment. He's a rough and rolling bullet man, quite a tough one known throughout the land. Men respect him, the golden bullet man. He's a winner, he leads at every hand. He's a lover, confused. Girls with each other, he leaves them, cheats and lies and deceives them. He's a rough one, the golden bullet man, quite a tough one known throughout the land. Men respect him, the golden bullet man, but the winner wins at every hand. In 1971, the APAR Films foursome introduced super spy Henry Sorelli to films. Henry had an earlier incarnation as an audio star in the radio series Gun for Henry. Gun for Henry! Are you Mr. Sorelli? Yes, I'm Mr. Henry Sorelli. I've got something for you. Pow, 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 pow. Uh, 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 uh. It was um, it was funny. Uh, the Henry movies. The, f the first one was had a brilliant chase sequence, which uh, uh, was re it was really our first movie, and we had done Clayton Rogers movies in 1969, 1970, but. Um, we didn't make them, we made them as sort of a goof. We, we started taking them more seriously with Wishing You Were Dead, which was in one of the strangest characters in the Henry Sorelli films was Henry's nominal superior, a ventriloquist dummy named Father. Father was supposed to give Sorelli his assignment in each film, but Doherty, who voiced the dummy, would simply improvise nonsense dialogue, which made it hard for star Alan Saley to keep a straight face. Father appeared in three of the six films. The other film that I really uh, remember particularly fondly is, uh, of all things, a, a, a silly little thing called Blue, I Am Invisible, where uh, uh, I play uh, uh, a man in a blue shirt who drinks a blue liquid that renders him invisible, and uh, the better to uh, create mischief and havoc for Henry Sorelli. And um, it's a pretty absurd, uh, absurd film. At one point, uh, Father Dan O'Day, the dummy, uh, who's ostensibly Henry Sorelli's uh, boss, is uh, flying around like an airplane, and Christian is singing, Airplane father, airplane father, airplane father. Airplane father coming down for a landing. Control tower, control. <laughs> this blue invisible really makes me so evil. Just take father and get him out of here, while Henry doesn't suspect. Was he telling the truth? I, I have a soft spot in my heart for that movie for some reason. After the action-packed nonsense of the Sorelli films, Doherty wanted to try something different. 
In January 1972, he adapted his own short story into a moody, German expressionistic style horror film called The Place. We're here at the set of The Place, I believe done 30 years ago, in uh, beautiful black and white. We filmed a wonderful scene with Tom Sinclair, wonderful actor, buried, sort of, not buried, but you know, in sort of like a lot of snow and the light reflected off the snow to make the, the uh, scene a surrealistic uh, beauty of black and white footage done at night. Uh, if it hadn't been done at night, um, it would be during the day, of course, but, you know, with the snow, it really helped the effect of, of seeing everything in the film. And uh, the movies I really remember from that, that, that time, 1971 and 72, the start of the APAR era, uh, were that movie, The Place, the black and white movie that uh, is so uh, odd and bizarre and eerie today. I remember distinctly, uh, I think we filmed it uh, in uh, two weekends at, uh, part of it was filmed at Tom Soder's uh, parents' uh, palatial Riverside Drive apartment uh, in a small room uh, across from their bedroom. And parts of it were filmed at uh, Grant's tomb at night and uh, the, the effect of this movie, it's, it's just a bizarre movie that I think uh, you know you can, you can watch and take away different things from it. Uh, I mean it's purely, uh, purely insane but it's, it's a great, great piece of film, film uh, making. It was, a, it was a fully told story in a way that some of the, st some of the other films were not really. Um, it, was, uh, it was sort of a self-contained uh, uh, wonderful little tale. I loved it. He was one of a kind, that Uncle Silas. A real mean fellow, if ever I saw one. I realized I had forgotten my briefcase. Young fool that I was, I returned. Uncle was furious. Then it hit me. Uncle was a warlock. I remember the place as a film which was very unlike anything he'd ever done before, because he tried a lot of um, uh, static shots, you know, single shots, a long take of Alan, uh, just telling a story. It was very unlike his usual fluid, quick cutting films. Uh, and um, it was quite remarkable. I think it was one of the first films we did in black and white, um, which uh, was something Kristen became fascinated with because you could. Um, uh, shoot at night and in low light conditions um, outside and we actually shot some footage of the place outside at night. Alan Saley recalls a technical trick that caused him some pain. Um, I had a history of experimenting with lighter fluid and um, there was a scene in which me that I had to do something uh, frightening to, uh, to scare a young boy in this film. I was a warlock so I dipped my finger in uh, I believe it was rubbing alcohol and lit it, on, lit it on fire. It did hurt, actually. That's why I, you can see me grimace in the film. Well, I think a chase is obviously the way to get people's attention. Uh, I mean, if you want to get a dog interested or a cat, you'll start chasing. So it appeals to a very basic you know, mammalian, reptilian brainstem thing. You see something running, you want to either run after it or run away from it. One of the criticisms of APAR films and the work of Christian Doherty 
was that most of the movies were variations on a single theme, the chase. In various movies, the combinations of who was chasing who made all the difference. Tom Sinclair and Tom Soto would chase Alan Saley, Saley and Sinclair would chase Soto, or Soto and Saley would chase Sinclair. There was the occasional innovation, Sinclair chasing Soto without Saley, or Soto or Saley chasing Evan Jones, or director Christian Doughty chasing Tom Soto, or, vive la difference, Alan Saley chasing a girl, Leslie Parker. As one participant joked, some people call them exciting, but for me, the movies were a good way to get some exercise. Um, I was, you know, kind of a very uh, lazy, retiring sort, uh, uh, and a much more of a walker than a runner, so that um, I really had to kind of rev myself up for the running and the, the activity and the action, you know. Um, I'm more of a, a, an armchair kind of guy, you know. But, uh, you know, looking back, you know, you can see in some of the movies I, I did rouse myself to a, a, a certain level of activity. The most elaborate chase sequence devised by Doughty was the 14-minute chase in Don't Live for Tomorrow. It started with Alan Saley chasing Evan Jones on foot. Jones gets on a bus, and Saley follows on a commandeered bicycle. Then after Jones flees the bus, in a classic Doughty move, the hero gets on the bus as the villain gets off. The chase then continues on bicycles, followed by a foot chase and a final brutal shootout in Lincoln Center. The chase took three weekends, six days to film. Because of elaborate camera work involving different points of view, Darty and the actors had to keep getting on and off buses and bikes. This meant that Jones, actress Sally Prager, and Darty would get on a bus and the director would film Jones threatening Prager with shots from the bus of Saley in pursuit. The trio would get off the bus at 96th Street, meet Saley and the rest of the crew, and walk back to where the chase began on 106th Street, and wait for another bus. When a bus would finally arrive, Jones and Prager would get on while Darty would get on a bike, camera in hand, and film Saley pursuing the bus. There was even an aerial shot taken from the top of a nearby building. The entire bus sequence was not only time-consuming, since buses ran on a more leisurely weekend schedule, it was also pricey, since the filmmakers had to pay a new fare each time they got on a bus and sometimes they had to deal with irate bus drivers. You can't just film it straight through, you got to take and retake and stuff, so we had to use more than one bus. And the, dri yeah, the drivers weren't always, weren't always too amused. So the bus driver threw Evan Jones and his girlfriend Sally Prager off at uh, one point and uh, said, get out of here. And then we found a very affable bus driver who decided to let us stay on the bus. In 1972 and 73, APAR expanded its scope. Previously, locations had been confined to the filmmaker's backyard. All of the movies had been shot in New York City. But in 1972, Doughty and Alan Saley traveled to England together with their families, and the two of them shot exteriors for their epic Don't Live for Tomorrow. The following year, Doughty and Tom Soter traveled to London together, and then to Greece, where they were joined by Alan Saley. Each country produced memorable travelogue-style footage that was later incorporated into the Sorelli movies. The trips also resulted in two of Doughty's most popular films. The film The Photographer was shot in London. Christian and I were on vacation there, uh, and he said, let's make a movie. And we came up with a sort of thin plot about me being followed by some unknown person and as, as I went around taking pictures of uh, London. And um, then uh, I, Christian refused to edit it because I think he realized there was not much to it. And uh, years later, when I was doing the uh, re-edit of the film for YouTube, I took the footage and I created a second character by including Alan Saley from footage he had shot in London the year before. And uh, that was how we created a, a secondary plot. And the movie has been very successful on YouTube. Uh, the idea came about, we, we decided off the cuff to sort of uh, create a technical, be technically better film than the ones we had, and I would edit it better than any film we had ever had. We came up with several Roger Corman-esque like, ideas, like being buried in the sand and, and violence and all that, but 
at the same time, it was sort of an original film. We just we decided to progress uh, physically into the next film of filmmaking. Uh, the uh, Sandman came about because uh, Christian Allen and I were in Greece t together for a trip with my family, and uh, we were relaxing. And Christian said, "Why don't we make a movie?" And we had a movie camera, so we came up with this crazy idea, sort of a Twilight Zone esque story, where uh, two guys are on the beach, and for no reason whatsoever. Uh, he, one of them hits the other and buries him in the sand up to his neck. Um, it's a strange story because the guy who's buried comes back from the dead, apparently, and drowns the other guy. And it's sort of a grotesque story, but it's done in beautiful locations, which everyone seems to love. And um, we never thought much of it, but it's been the most popular film that Christian has made, uh, judging by the audience on YouTube. In 1972, the tight little group began splintering off, and newcomers joined the ranks of APAR films. This Will Really Kill You, the most elaborate production yet, was shot under the studio name of Savoy Pictures, which may have indicated Doherty's restlessness. It was the second of the Jason Rogers movies based on the short stories by Tom Sinclair. Doherty himself took on the role of Jason Rogers, whom he had played on the radio. The character of Jason Rogers, as I originally started writing him, uh, was very uh, one-dimensional and uh, sort of like I was trying to create my own sort of, uh, you know, compositive uh, Sherlock Holmes and Ellery Queen and, and uh, Mike Shane and all the detectives that I, I read about. And um, he didn't have much, much life or personality to him. And I believe that uh, once uh, Christian started, started playing Jason Rogers, both on the tape recorded uh, Jason Rogers' show and in the films, um, it sort of brought him to life as a kind of a borderline psycho, a really a real crazy man. And um, I started writing him that way in the, in the Pulp Fiction uh, Jason Rogers stories. Yeah, well, I remember doing this, uh, this fight with Christian where he, um, I was the bad guy and I was chasing him with a gun. And of course, and I shoot him in the shoulder, and I shoot him in the um, other shoulder, and yet he's able to jump on my back and wrestle me down the hill and uh, beat the crap out of me. I think it was 1972, 1971. Alan Saley had a large part in it. He staged some of the sequences. He influenced me, and everyone worked together on it, and we filmed it at the Tom Soder's palatial. Uh, apartment a long time ago and uh, and uh, it turned out to be rather well received. This Will Really Kill You was the first feature to widely expand the cast. Seems like the number of people, the crowd that was involved in making the movies just kept growing. We had developed something of a reputation in the school uh, and I think people liked the fact that we were making movies. It was kind of a fun thing to do and so I think we got more people involved. You, you say it's 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 sort of a it's sort of a cult-like thing now. It was, it was sort of a cult-like thing then. The film went outside the original trio of Alan Saley, Tom Sinclair, and Tom Sota to cast Doherty's childhood friend Evan Jones as the psychotic villain. He was really a sweet kind of guy. I miss him. I don't know what happened to him. He sort of had this mad quality about him and this sort of uh, anarchy he had. He'd be on the bed together, looking at his toy tractor toy truck um, mowing us down sort of in a fantasy of uh, rage uh, you know the truck would turn whatever you want it wanted to we played with this gas station it was very creative did, did it bother me that uh, that I that I looked on as a psychotic or that I had psychotic roles no not at all I had a great time with it I love that I love that um, I like it now uh, it, it, after all it's just acting <laughs> This Will Really Kill You and its follow-up, You Made Me Hate Myself, were departures for APAR in that they each featured psychologically scarred characters in both films played by Jones. They also had prominent roles for women, until now seen only briefly in the Henry Sorelli pictures. In both films, high school beauty Emily Gould appeared as a bad girl who got her comeuppance. Right, women were very one-dimensional or maybe two-dimensional. They were either... Uh objects of desire or uh, victims and uh, neither portrayal was uh, very very nuanced 
to say the least. So, um, APAR Films' uh, attitude toward women was not exactly politically correct, uh, and uh, I guess it raised some eyebrows even at the time. You know, women were, uh, you know, uh, either uh, pieces of meat or bimbos or evil or just uh, the enemy, you know? And uh, part of that, is, I guess it's sort of like uh, us kind of growing, coming of age, being young guys, you know, getting interested in women, but still, we were kind of like uh, still not too far removed from uh, watching and identifying with the little rascals and the, the He-Man Woman Haters Club, you know? So that um, women didn't, uh, didn't come off particularly well in APAR films. I think the, the women in the APAR films were either uh, virtuous or villainous. There wasn't really any gray area. You were either a good girl or a bad girl. Um, I suppose in some films women want, you know, to be, have a little more color to them than that. But, but I was young and I enjoyed what I did. Well, you know, we were all very un enamored of uh, the James Bond movies. And uh, you have to put it in the context of, uh, of the times, I think. Um, I think there's a, a sort of a, a, a it was, there was a tongue-in-cheek quality to it. So um, I didn't really feel that it was uh, putting down women. African Americans didn't fare much better than women in the APAR world. You know, it's sort of like a, um, a, a cliche that, uh, you know, in, in movies, uh, some people have pointed out in, uh, in, in intervening years that, you know, the, the black guy always gets killed, you know. The, um, I guess uh, it, was, uh, it was sort of like that, you know, in retrospect, I don't know. You know, I don't know if that, that, that was the intent, you know, but um, I think I, uh, I died well. Yeah, Pressure Point was uh, filmed in, in two weekends, uh, shooting all day Saturday on the, uh, the far west side in the West 50s, over by the West Side Highway. And uh, I played a sort of a hapless, happy-go-lucky guy walking around, um, and uh, I was uh, spotted and trailed and attacked by uh, Tom Soderer and Alan Saley. Looking back, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm greatly pleased and greatly amused by Pressure Point because it's, um, you know, kind of a, a, a very, in a sense, a one-dimensional movie. It's, it's you know, chase and, uh, you know, uh, violence and uh, retribution and, you know, death and all of that stuff. And in that sense, um, you know, it's, it, it's sort of a, a, a pinnacle of, of uh, a personal pinnacle for me of my involvement with APAR films and it was the one film in which I was actually the de facto star. So. By the end of 1972 the original APAR team of Alan Saley, Tom Soter and Tom Sinclair was reunited for the bank robbery chase picture The Theft of Reason after which Doherty became consumed with his epic production Don't Live for Tomorrow. The sixth and final Henry Sorelli picture, it spanned three countries. Shot in the United States, England and Greece, the movie was intended to be the greatest A-par epic of all. Technically, it was the most polished of the studio's productions. The elaborate 75-minute adventure took months to film. Visually, the movie showed Doherty's star at its brightest point, with carefully composed shots, and editing that was tighter and more intense than it had ever been before. As seen in this sequence, in which Saley is beaten by Soter and Jones in Central Park. But the dialogue, credited to Doherty, Saley and Soter did not match the visuals. Although amusing in parts, it was generally unsophisticated, and badly dubbed as well. Good evening, Claude. Good evening, Henry, and my name isn't Claude, it's Claude Cleaver, otherwise known as The Boss. Who's that? I recognize him, it's... It's Armstrong, the man who disappeared a week ago. I've been looking for him for a long time. I found him in a rector installation. Armstrong was too headstrong. It appears he has been subjected to unbelievable torture. The movie was screened for English filmmaker Muriel Box, who had co-written the classic psychological drama The Seventh Veil, and her husband, Lord Gerald Gardner, 
who were friends of the Soter family. When Box criticised aspects of the film, Darty walked out. It did not bode well for the future of the director or APAR films. Darty's thin skin and iron-fisted control had surfaced earlier. As early as 1972, there had been rumbles of discontent from the cast, who often felt their ideas were given only cursory glances. Well, like many other things in the APAR films, um, the story is that Christian told you to do something and you did it. You had to give over your ideas about how the film should, uh, should go. You had to kind of do what he wanted, but as long as you accepted that as a ground rule, it was a lot of fun. And of course, we had those good pancakes at his mom's house. When You Made Me Hate Myself was finished, Tom Soter and Alan Saley objected to the wilder logic of much of the movie. And Darty, angrily washing his hands of the movie, let Soter and Saley do some dubbing and re-editing. After they were finished, he then redubbed it himself, incorporating some of their changes. The movie was still fairly incoherent, although it still had flashes of visual brilliance, and it even had an appearance by the director's father, Chet, a professional actor, as a police officer. Things were getting tense, and the group was starting to split up. Tom Sinclair, who had only a cameo as the drug-addled agent Armstrong in Don't Live for Tomorrow, was appearing less and less frequently, his parts increasingly taken by Evan Jones. Uh, where I was kind of drifting into, into other realms, uh, you know, uh, other, other habits, um, less uh, creative possibly and less productive, but uh, nevertheless very compelling, you know. And, um, you know, specifically I was enjoying uh, altering my consciousness through the uh, use and abuse of alcohol and other substances. For Thou Shalt Not Live, Darty's Kung Fu movie, former leading man Alan Saley took on a secondary role as the villain, and Evan Jones became the unlikely bespectacled hero. When questioned about the casting of a non-Asian in a typically Asian role, Darty reportedly offered the explanation that Evan looks vaguely Chinese. Tom Sinclair turned up in a cameo and was quickly killed, while Tom Sota did not appear at all. Well, everybody in that time thought they could do some kung fu, and uh, we were fooling around. Uh, Chris had a friend, had a nice penthouse apartment, and we shot a lot of it up there. You know, we had a stunt director in there who uh, gave us some interesting moves. Uh, but I don't think it really panned out uh, as well as it could have. Uh, and, and the scene that I remember best, the famous uh, scene with the uh, gardening uh, pruning hook and the uh, cocktail onions didn't seem to make it to YouTube. So that was that was the first one where I w where I was playing a somewhat more prominent role. Um, norm normally I was or I was one of the bad guys after, uh, after Sorelli. So I was actually I actually was the, was I suppose the protagonist. And the I remember the the the, the irony was is that it was all hand to hand fighting. Unlike, there was a lot of gunplay in the other movies, but in this one it was all hand-to-hand -hand fighting until the very end in which the gun triumphed after all. And you got shot. And I got shot, yes. Darty was now becoming more erratic and more of a perfectionist, if it were possible, in his filmmaking. He would start new movies without finishing others, leaving a number of films, such as Make-A-Wish, The Photographer, and Pressure Point 2, half-finished or incomplete. Darty who seemed sick of violence, then had made his final film between 1974 and 75, an unfinished project that was finally completed in 2009 and given the title Elysian Fields. I was going through the films and I discovered a, a film canister that was labeled Martha's Vineyard and uh, I didn't know what this footage was, I thought it was home movies. It turns out it was a film Christian had made from odds and ends of uh, unfinished f uh, films he had made outtakes, uh, stuff he had shot over the years. It was a strange, sort of dreamlike film, quite unlike anything he'd ever done before.
Orson Welles, and it has an Orson Welles-like quality, but what it struck me most about it was it was uh, like a French film. You know, there's even a scene where I'm talking to Christian in the windowsill of my parents' apartment, and the, it's a static shot, but we seem to be reflecting on things. So what I did was I, I wrote a new script for the film, because uh, it had no soundtrack to it, and uh, I tried to make sense of it, and I did a parody of a French movie. Quelle est la vie d'un acteur bien connu et à la retraite comme la vôtre? Pas grand chose. Je regarde les oiseaux. <rire> Je regarde la rivière devant ma fenêtre. Je contemple les tribulations de ma vie. Mon père m'a dit une fois, la vie est devant nous. Ne regarde jamais en arrière. Mais toute ma vie a été un regard en arrière, il me semble. Mais est-ce que vous pourrez jamais vous pardonner pour la violence de vos films, pour leur influence sur les enfants, sur le monde Vous avez certainement une responsabilité. Certainement, mon ami. <rire> Nous avons tous une responsabilité pour l'état du monde entier. Mais la violence dans mes films, c'est pas sérieuse. C'est comme si une petite pellet cruisait dans mon cerveau. Et alors, on se réveille avec un trou dans la tête. It was the end of APAR films. The offbeat humor, the endless chases, the silly, intense violence had all run their course. Christian Doughty's playground was closed. Perhaps forever. Why it ended, you know, why, did, why does anything good end, you know? Uh, it's the intrusion of, of life, you know. Uh, life gets in the way. Well, I think that, uh, that Chris didn't go to film school. He probably should have. And uh, we didn't have enough of a reason to keep him going. I think Chris, uh, maybe, maybe he ran out of ideas. Uh, maybe he ran out of money. Um, it was sort of a nip and tuck thing. Uh, it could have uh, been very successful. All I know is, is that they, they stopped being made. I wasn't really in on the, you know, I wasn't really in on the details of how it broke up or how it stopped. Um, I, you know, I, you know, we, you know, then, you know, things, things ended, you know, it was towards the end of high school. You know, we, we went off to college and, uh, and, 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 you know, things sort of passed on. I was very demanding, uh, you know, I could be, I could be cruel. I ended up alone because my last actor, John Burleson, walked out and he said he had had enough. I just lost all my friends, you know, Tom Soder now and Salem moved on and, and I was, uh, became very reclusive and uh, people basically forgot about the films for a while. I was 11 and in the school that uh, we went to, I was waiting for the elevator and I saw a sign that said three films uh, made by Alan Saley and uh, Tom Soder. And I just thought out loud, you know, I said, what's an Alan Saley and a Tom Soder? And one of the teachers uh, at, at the school who happened to be standing there, I, I thought I was by myself, said, oh, there's students here at the school and they make films. And I said, they make films? And, and it said admission was 25 cents. I said, I gotta go. Montalvo was fascinated and enthusiastic about what he saw, and watched the films again and again. He never forgot them either, and in 2007 he contacted Tom Soda. I just always wondered whatever happened to you guys, and I, I just plugged in names in the internet, I saw your websites and your email address, and I emailed you. And I inquired about the films, I, you wrote back saying, oh, the films are still around, and they're, you know, they're very impressive in terms of, you know, the technical aspects of uh, filmmaking. A, movie, a big movie would cost, you know, a few million, you know, three, four million dollars, five million dollars. I mean, you know, APAR was really incredible because they, they were making films for like, you know, like eight dollars, you know, twelve dollars. I mean, I don't know how they did it. I mean, it was like, it was beyond low budget. You know, I mean, they, they, they weren't cutting corners. They, there were no corners, you know. I mean, and, and you see their work. It's incredible work. I mean, you know, they have bike chases, they have uh, uh, foot chases, you know, they have some car chases. I mean, you know, this stuff can be, you, you put this right up with the, the early Bond films. And Sean Connery is James Bond, you know, he, he'll stand in his white tuxedo and bow tie in an elitist uh, casino 
with his martini shaken, not stirred, you know. And everybody, you know, makes such a big deal. Oh, he's so cool, and he is. Alan Saley is Henry Sorelli could stand waiting for the number four bus over here on Riverside Drive with a can of fresco with a purple straw in it and look just as cool. I've played sort of the femme fatale of the films, if, it, if, if I may. Um, and I enjoyed doing it a lot. And I was always very impressed with the, the guys and um, how they made the films so professionally, sort of taking off on all these spoofs on other shows and other directors. And I thought my brother's filming was magnificent. And they were fun. And they were full of surprises. And sometimes you couldn't help but laugh and laugh and also be intrigued at the same time. It's almost as if Tarantino learned what he was, uh, learned his craft from Christian Doherty. That's how it feels to me when I saw Tarantino for the first time. I thought, this is really uh, Christian at, a, at an older age. And, um, and I, I think of all of the people who created APAR films, it's truly Christian that is the really extraordinary talent. Montalvo's interest spurred Sota Saley and Sinclair to begin the APAR restoration project, transferring the surviving films from deteriorating film stock to DVDs. Of the 24 films, only five, including two of the Jason Rogers movies as well as Doughty's first movie, The Jake Rock Incident, are considered lost. Tom Sinclair recently reflected on his first appearance in an APAR film, the science fiction saga Clayton Rogers and the Palfaganian Menace, which was loosely based on a story he had written. All I remember about that movie is that it was very, very cold, and we were shooting, and the, the winter uh, smoke was billowing out of our nostrils and mouths. And uh, I remember I had a, uh, a large uh, corduroy, brown corduroy coat, and uh, I still had, had short hair, and uh, I remember watching footage of it and saying, boy, I look really nerdy. So maybe I'm not too sad that footage no longer exists. In 2009, with the consent and cooperation of Christian Doughty, the films were put on the internet service YouTube, where they received their widest following yet. In fact, an Italian web service picked up the adventures of Henry Sorelli for a new generation of fans. Tom Sota also presented 10-minute re-edits of the Sorelli films to try and put more logic into the series, but he found that Doughty's original, illogical versions still inspired the greatest loyalty. And then the, the funny thing was, I mean, I put these all up on YouTube, and they were, uh, they were reasonably popular, but the most popular one was uh, the most absurd one, which was uh, the fairy tale affair, which was... Uh, actually um, blue I'm invisible and it was almost intact that's the one I did the least editing to and it was the most popular in terms of most views so it shows you that Doherty was onto something and who should have the final word on APAR films it was, it was a memorable part of my life I remember more about doing the films uh, than I remember about a lot of the rest of my life around that period of time. So it did stand out. It was very much, it was an anomaly. You know, most, most kids aren't, you know, going around making films in high school. They're off doing other things. So it's, it, 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 so it stuck with me. Only I thought it would just, you know, always be locked away there and that I would just think back on it and remember it, what, what I did. I remember it as a very, you know, very enjoyable, you know, very fun part of uh, my life. And I'm very happy I was involved. And no, I did not expect that they would reappear 35 years later. And I'm very tickled that they did. Interestingly enough, you know, here it is uh, more than 35 years later. And uh, APAR Films is sort of getting a, a second life. It's, uh, you know, on, they're on YouTube. And, uh, you know, there are documentaries being made about APAR Films. So, um, you know, it's like the, they, they talk about, uh, you know, there's a saying that no one really ever dies, you know, and because uh, the deeds that you do and the, the influence that you have on people lives on. And uh, so it is with APAR Films that uh, here they are living on all these years later and uh, people are looking at them and uh, 
scratching their heads, I'm sure, about some aspects of APAR films, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just delighted that they're, uh, they're still around and they're getting a, a, a second life, you know, and, uh, you know, hindsight, uh, you know, I don't know that hindsight's always 2020, but uh, in hindsight, uh, there was more to APAR films, I think, than uh, initially met the eye, and we're, we're seeing that now. I remember them, I remember them well, you know, um, women, beautiful women, uh, psychotic, uh, psychotic uh, masterminds which behind, uh, behind uh, things that ha would happen of uh, sociopathic sort of things that Evan Jones sort of carried through. And, uh, and last of all, the hero comes at the end, probably in some respects gets the girl, but in real life didn't really get the girl. But, you know, that's showbiz. Cleaver, Claude, Cleaver, Claude Cleaver. <laughs> He's the man, the man with the bullet touch, the Cleaver crutch. <laughs> Claude Cleaver. <laughs> okay, let's do it now. Alan, come on, let's do it now. Come on! <laughs> Claude Cleaver! Da, da, da. He's the man! You made me hate myself Now I have no one You made me see myself now I have nowhere to run You made me hate myself You made me hate myself You made me hate myself You made me hate No, no, don't kill me. Don't shoot me. Don't, not with a gun. Don't. Calm, calm. You hear me? Call him. Dial that number. You know his number. You call him. No, please. <laughs> I've got to get a stair vehicle. Maybe I, maybe I can get into it and get down down the stairs. I must. I must get away from this hand. I must. <laughs> no, there's an axe coming down to me, and I there's no way to get out. Gun for Henry. You made me hate myself. 
You made me run. You made me hate myself. And now I'm with a son. Probably isn't any better now than I was then. <laughs>